of January uh, 2021. Can I please remind you to switch off your phones or switch them on to silent for the duration of the meeting? In addition, can I refer you to the yeah, protocol for remote meeting? Thank you, thank you, Jane. Bye bye. Barbara's, sorry, Chair, Barbara's managed to unmute herself now. Are you, Barbara? <laughs> That's a miracle. <laughs> right. Welcome, Barbara. Right, start again then, anyway. Good morning. Welcome to the meeting. Uh, can I please remind you to put your phones on to silent or turn them off, please? Uh, and in addition, can I refer you to the protocols for remote meetings? And they are your microphone should be switched to mute unless you were speaking. The Democratic Services Officer will take a roll call at the start of the meeting of all members and officers. Should you wish to ask a question or make a comment, can you please indicate <coughs> by chat function or by raising your electronic hand via Teams? You know what that is? There's a should be a bar of icons on your screen and one of them is in the shape of hands. So if you wish to speak, please raise that electronic hand and could I please ask you when you finish speaking, will you lower the hand so that I know who's wishing to speak and who's not. Uh, and before we begin, uh, can I take this opportunity, uh, although he's not online yet, to welcome our new community councillor representative, councillor Jerry Reynolds, <coughs> presently of Glynny Town Council. Um, well, I'm Cliff Jones, I'm the chair, and I hope you know that. Uh, and Tammy, I'll ask you now if you could take the roll call, please. Certainly, Chair. Thank you very much. So present and participating in today's meeting, uh, yourself, the Chair, Cliff Jones. Present there, Cliff? Yeah. Thank you. Vice Chair, Barbara Richards. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Councillors Dennis Keogh. Present. And Sharon Freegard. Present. Thank you. Co-optees Louise Fleet. Present. Thank you. And Tom Ward. Present. Thank you. We're awaiting Jerry's um, attendance. We're trying to get him on board for the meeting. Officers, we have myself, Tammy Davis from Democratic Services and Craig Griffith. Yes, I'm here, Tammy. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Tammy. OK, and, and we're for it. So um, I must ask, you know, are there any interests to declare? If there are, please indicate by raising your electronic hand um, or by your teams or the chat function. Uh, and when called, please state the details. Tammy will forward an electronic version of the form for you to complete an email back to her. So any interest to declare, please. I can't see electronic hands and I can't hear. Uh, just there's a, there's a message here somewhere. No. No. Okay. So we'll move on to the uh, to the agenda for the meeting. Um, the minutes of a previous meeting on the 6th of March 2020 are set out on pages three and four of your uh, document bundle. Are there any comments uh, to make on these minutes, please? Right, if there aren't any comments, can I have a proposal and seconder to approve the minutes? I, I move, Chair. Thank you. Second, Chair. Thank you very much, Louise. OK. Um, is there anyone who is against? Please indicate by raising your electronic hand. Do you see anybody, Tammy? No, Chair. OK, then. So we go on to agenda item three, the Public Service Ombudsman for Wales report. Um, and I'll now ask Craig Griffiths to introduce the report, please, Craig. 
There we go. Thank you very much, Chair. So this is a report that we bring annually to every Standards Committee, and I, I should point out in the first instance that it relates to the 2019-2020 civic year. So going back a little bit, obviously, in that sense. And what it does, it sets out an overview as to the nature of the complaints, obviously, that the Council has received in two areas, the service-related complaints, but also then our Code of Conduct-related complaints then that have ultimately arisen during that period. Now, as members will be aware, we did have some referrals to the Standards Committee during that period, and we did have two hearings, but they were classed under previous um, years in that sense. But what you will be able to see from a code of conduct perspective is that in respect of County Borough Councillors, so that's Neath Patalba Council, we had four complaints that were made to the Ombudsman against councillors, but they were all closed after initial consideration. And what that effectively means is the Ombudsman felt that there was nothing there that actually warranted any investigation or any sort of further dealings on their part. We also then had um, some town and community council code of conduct complaints that were made relating to Britain Ferry Town Council, Code Frank Town Council and Gleneath Town Council. And again, all of those were ultimately investigated and determined that there was no further action that ultimately needed to be taken from it. What it's also obviously risen is that says we do see that we do still have a number of different complaints which have ultimately been made. So work is ongoing with council officers to try and address these, not only from the service perspective, obviously, so we can make sure that um, the, the needs of the constituents are ultimately being met, but also from a code of conduct perspective by making sure that we are continuing to make members aware of their um, obligations. We have some training now which has been shared out for the next couple of weeks. Um, I believe around the end of March on a code of conduct refresher for our members. We're also going to be looking at some further guidance to perhaps clarify things about usage of social media. Um, personal and prejudicial interest is something that um, often comes up in debate, so I'm going to try and issue some further guidance notes. You may have seen more recently in the news surrounding Merthyr Council, there's been quite an active case with regards to um, code of conduct interest and not being declared. We're still waiting for the final case summary of that, which I'll be bringing to the Standards Committee in due course, but there could be some learning which we can hopefully then bring about then to um, other members. And I am still continuing to try and develop the code of conduct related matters with town councils. We have a report which is going to come slightly later where I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail but I think it's important that given that the bulk of complaints are still coming from community councils and town councils that that be an area that we try and target going forward. I'm also as well doing the course of this year and I'll be bringing some reports to the Standards Committee in due course as well as the various scrutiny committees looking at a review of our constitution and that will have some elements related to code of conduct where my aim is to try and give a lot more clarity to members for especially as we go into next year, go for government elections where we could have some new members on the scene. So making sure whether things are readily understandable, practical examples are being provided and hopefully there will be that increased clarity then to members. So I'm happy to answer any questions, Chair, if any members have anything or to just to have a general discussion on any of those points. Thank you, Craig. Um, do any of our members have any questions? You can raise an electronic hand or raise your proper hand or any questions? Well, that's it. it uh, there aren't any questions, Craig. It's very comprehensive. It, it is sad, as you just mentioned. That, sorry, Louise. You muted, Louise. I'm just trying to find my electronic hand. Sorry, I should have just raised it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, th th thanks, thanks, Craig. Uh, good report. Just, just really out, out of interest. Uh, you said you um, uh, paragraph B on page um, eight. Um, you said that you're facilitating a working group of officers to consider the complaints and and learning from fr from that. So, just wondered what uh, format that workshop is 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 going to take and and what it is you're you're going to be. Um, uh, or what the focus of the workshop will be. Just a little bit more information on that, really. Indeed. So there are two specific elements that we're focusing on. There's been some recent guidance that's been produced via the Ombudsman's Office with regards to complaints handling and the need perhaps to have two types of documents. 
when being an internal document which relates to complaints and how officers are due to handle them but also a document to make members of the public ultimately aware as to what the complaints process will be so one of the work streams that we've been targeting has been the preparation of that document and that will go through the council's standard processes for approval in due course so it will come to us in about scrutiny committees what we've also been trying to do then as well is look at the more practical examples of learning that's come out of complaints so the officers for example, who deal with complaints in their respective directorates will keep accurate records of all the various complaints they've had, different issues that have cropped up, where lessons learned have ultimately been developed. And it's more of just an, an informal program more than anything. So officers can take into account that something that happens in an environment directorate could also take some precedence in the social services directorate and just try and find learning, shared practice, an opportunity to have a discussion as to the way one officer would approach it compared to another officer and it's, it's just about sharing techniques and learning more yeah. than anything with elements so there's no formality attached to the meeting it's just a more general discussion where we identify things we've seen where i've had correspondence back and forth from the ombudsman and some of the elements that they are suggesting to me if there are some legal issues that ultimately come up it's just a way of trying to bring officers together and making sure that we've got some consistency in our approaches as well so if somebody was to make a complaint to our environment directorate and they then make a complaint to our social services director there's consistency in how that process ultimately follows so general dialogue and discussion mm -hmm. are one predominant yeah no it sounds that, that that sounds very positive is is there a loop um you know how do you close the loop from the complaints coming in analyzing the complaints that learning taking place and and sharing that knowledge and and actually then making any changes either to processes or procedures and then you know how how is that loop closed is it through what you know, we what we what we would have normally is a general discussion and then the, the key officers who are responsible for our complaints policies will also want to be attendance at that meeting and we go away then and revisit and if we think we need to make amendments to anything we would then look at the policy see what changes are necessary and we would take it through a decision making process then so it would likely go to our scrutiny committee and then the cabinet for final sanction so there is that member involvement ultimately in the process and one of the examples we've seen now is we have have identified some recent changes because we've seen for example there's been a lot of cases where um, members of the public are recording conversations and so we've been looking at ways to make sure that staff are protected members of the public are aware different elements of how it's going to be used so we've had made some revisions to the policy as a result of that and all of that will now be incorporated in the newest version that will come to its members in um, the spring hopefully yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. M may I ask a another question? Um, it, it, it might, I might have missed it actually in the papers, but in paragraph 13, there's this reference for the Ombudsman to undertake own initiative complaints. Could you just tell me what own initiative complaints, what that of actually course. means? As it stands at the moment, the um, for the Ombudsman to actually investigate a complaint, there has to be a complaint made to him by a member of the public or somebody who is eligible to make a complaint. There's a new power that came about in the legislation from the Welsh Government about two, 18 months ago now. And what they've basically given a power to the Ombudsman is if he sees that there are issues in particular bodies or there are concerns which he is picking up, he doesn't have to wait anymore for a complaint to be made by a member of the public. He can act under his own volition and go in and undertake an investigation itself. So it's very similar in some ways to powers that Audit Wales would have in respect of financial issues and, and such there. It's, it's looking at service related issues and there hasn't been any actually implemented to date from what I've seen so far, but he has indicated, for example, it could give powers to investigate health boards, local authorities where he sees systematic system failures or a number of complaints relating to certain areas which are not being addressed ultimately by um, public bodies. So it's a much more wide ranging scope now for him mm. to come in on his own mission without having to wait then for those complaints to be made to him. Yes, I mean, I can understand how, um, you know, how, how these issues might, he might be alerted to these issues, you know, through lots of complaints. But, but otherwise, how would the Ombudsman actually identify issues that he would wish to undertake on his own initiative? 
It could be through a number of different bases. Um, for example, common themes of complaints, ultimately, mm -hmm. which are coming through in respect of certain areas. So if he receives a number of complaints against one public body on a certain criteria, that could be a basis. It could be something maybe that is reported by the press, which he feels is worthy of consideration. It could be referral from another body who has been in to undertake a statutory inspection or a regulatory issue. So there's a lot more engagement now between um, regulatory bodies where they try to perhaps encourage different people to come in to do different elements of work. So it, it's, it's all part of just basically having that extensive power that he can target yes. anything that he feels is ultimately relevant yeah. um, from, from whatever source it, it derives from. Yes, that's that sounds um, a very, um, very useful power to have because having that joined up approach where the regulators and, and other people like the Ombudsman are working together, then it can be a, a, like a partnership approach to improving services, both for the for the service deliverers and for the public as well. So, so yeah, that sounds good. OK, thank you, Craig. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Craig. Uh, anybody else got questions for Craig, please? Chair, could I just point out that we've been joined now by our Town and Community Councillor member, uh, Jerry Reynolds. All right, Jerry is um, using, I believe it's, I'm going to guess at your wife's email address. Is that right, Jerry? Because you, you, it says Elaine on it. You're not Elaine, you're Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> and you're on mute. So. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good morning, Jerry, and welcome to the meeting. Thanks very much. Sorry I'm late. Bit of a mishap earlier on. That's all right, Jerry. You're here. That's what's important. And, and welcome. Thank you. All right. Jerry, we've just dealt with agenda item three. Um, and we are dealing with agenda item three, and it looks as if we're <clears throat> reaching the end of that. So nobody else has any questions on agenda three. Can I then remove uh, sorry. Can I move on to agenda item four on, uh, on the agenda, the grant of dispensations? And again, uh, uh, that's an incident for Indeed. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, so there are two applications for dispensation have been made by two of the members. There are some amendments I just need to make to the report, unfortunately, that come in with just a few typos that we, we've picked up. So I'll just talk you through them in the first instance. So we've had a dispensation um, request from Councillor Matthew Crowley, whereas in paragraph 16 of the report, it does say Councillor M. Crawley. So just for clarity, that is Councillor Matthew Crawley. It's a standard process where members of um, council have um, family members who are employed by the council that they can have a dispensation to be able to vote and speak on matters unless they specifically relate obviously to those individuals or where families can ultimately benefit financially in some way. So this is one of the standard dispensations ultimately that members can apply for for these purposes. So the recommendation before members today is that a dispensation can be granted to, to Councillor Crawley in this regard. We've also had an application for a request for a dispensation from Councillor Doreen Jones. The reference here obviously is one voice will sadly is incorrect. The reference should be the NEATH BAME Association as uh, Councillor Doreen Jones has sat voluntarily on that particular board. So ultimately a dispensation can be granted to speak and vote on these matters if members of the Standards Committee are ultimately prepared to. I'm uh, happy to answer any questions, Chair. Thank you, Craig. Uh, do we have any questions for Craig? Uh, Councillor Fieger? No. Thank you, uh, Chair. Councillor Fieger, did yeah, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, Craig, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't sure whether or not, uh, following on what you've said now, I have joined two boards. Would I need to have dispensation should something come up from the boards? You can indeed, um, Councillor Freegard. If you can send me the details afterwards, I can put okay. them basically through an application process and we can bring it to the next standards committee then once we've cleared that up okay. for you. Thanks, Craig. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, if there aren't any further questions, there's a recommendation with all the uh, things on page 30, I think it's on page 26. Um, and I have a proposal and second that the report to the school uh, um, 
applications for grants and dispensation, please. Or if there's anyone against, can you make your vote? I yeah. move, Chair. Second, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, anybody against or any abstentions? No. Okay, if there are no abstentions, then the report recommend, uh, recommendations are approved. Thank you very much for that. Okay. And can we move on, if you give me a moment, to move on to um, agenda item five, if I can find it, because I'm all seven here. Here we are, I've got agenda item five. Um, it's the report at the end of legal services, which is Craig. So I'll ask Craig to introduce the report, please, Craig. Indeed. Thank you, Chair. There's nothing specific, obviously, to draw to members' attention with this report. What I like to do is when we have a new member who ultimately joins our standards committee, so Councillor Reynolds in that sense, I always like to bring a report just for clarity, setting out, obviously, what the terms of reference and the remit of our standards committee ultimately is. So the report is just there for information and to give a short overview, obviously, as to what the um, requirements ultimately are going to be and, and what we, we do here as a standards committee. The only point I, can, I think I could just add to it as well is during the course of this year, we are likely to see some changes to the remit of the Standards Committee, which I did touch upon previously um, as a result of the passing of the Local Government and Elections Wales Act, in that some new powers are being given to Standards Committee, where we will be able to um, hold group leaders to account in respect of code of conduct issues. So, for example, there will be an obligation on group leaders um, to make sure that their members are complying with code of conduct obligations, and they will have to appear before the Standards Committee effectively during the course of the year to explain how they approach such matters. And if you recall, at the last Standards Committee, we did agree a set of questions ultimately for group leaders to consider when they do come before the Standards Committee. And hopefully now at the next meeting, we will have our first group leader um, in attendance and we can start that process of um, the uh, asking questions, obviously, as to how they approach their, their con conduct related issues. Um, we will be producing as well annual reports from the Standards <coughs> Committee at the same time and again in the next meeting we'll, we'll start considering in the manner in which we do that. So happy to answer any questions chat in that sense. Thank you very much Craig. Uh, does anybody have questions for Craig and that? Jerry you've got your hand up. Oh yeah just one quick question Craig. Uh, does that mean any any of the group leaders, any of the recognised group leaders around the council could be called? Indeed. So we have three group leaders at the moment within the Talbot Council. So at some point during the course of the year, each one of them will appear before the Standards Committee um, to, to give that sort of overview. So of all the three parties and, and the could, three groups. And the supplementary, could we have them all around the table at the same time? Because that could be fun. <laughs> <laughs> we did discuss that issue. I think we decided previously um, we would do it on an individual basis in the first instance, so we can have that free flowing discussion from there, almost just about. Thanks. Okay, uh, uh, please, you go. Yeah, uh, Craig, can I, can I just ask then, what happens when um, members are independent? So there's no group leader for independence, is there? But certainly, you know, they, I would have thought there must be something to hold them to account as well. Indeed. So obviously within Neath Patal, but we have an independent group of members in that yeah. sense. So they do have a group leader in that sense. The obligation in respect of the, um, under the local government elections, Wales, they won't apply for independent members who are not affiliated to any particular yes. group. The obligation is still on them to comply with their code of conduct mm -hmm. obligations because obviously they will have signed the declaration on taking office. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. just a slightly different process where you have group leaders to make sure that the members of that affiliated group are ultimately in compliance then at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Okay, interesting, thank you. Right, does anybody else have any questions for Craig on that? No. Um, please, could I ask you to take your electronic hand down? <laughs> there we are, done. Thanks, Louise. Right, if there, um, if there aren't any further questions, then uh, we'll just note this report then, please. Okay. 
and move on to agenda item six, which is the Town and Community Council's Code of Conduct Matters. Um, and again, can I ask Craig to introduce the report, please? Uh, I thank you, Chair. Um, so members will recall at the last meeting we agreed we would send a questionnaire to all our town and community councils asking for how they approach code of conduct matters, what sort of training ultimately they put in place for various individuals and their various members. Um, we sent out the questionnaire then following the last standards committee and sadly we only received, I believe it was five responses from the town and community councils and the, the, the questions that we asked obviously and the results that we generated are then based in the report. Um, to summarise, we, we had the view that obviously they do have training, they have difficulty ultimately perhaps enforcing it with a lot of the members and that some ultimately don't attend, but as a community council they do ultimately um, arrange those elements. It, it was interesting the fact that there were not many issues with regards to people seeking a dispensation for various matters, which that one did surprise me a little bit because I would have thought there might have been some dispensation. So I, I'd like to prepare a note in due course to community councils to, to send out, basically saying that this is the scope where you are able to apply for dispensations before the standards committee. If you do have members who wish to speak or vote on various matters, they won't have to declare a prejudicial interest on any occasion. So I brought this report back today to standards committee, hoping we could have a quick discussion to see if there are any areas we particularly want to target or we would like to look at going forward or any work programmes we would like to discuss. And we can then hopefully start that process over the coming year of how we can engage more with those town and community councils. But but as I said, the majority, I get the impression, do have the systems and the processes in place. To me, I think it's about continuing engagement in that sense and trying to get that message across and hope we have some visibility in respect of um, conduct issues. So, Chair, happy to answer any questions and um, I can take a note then of any issues that are raised and we can prepare some reports for future Standards Committee or particular courses of action from there. Thank you very much, Craig. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Craig on this? Yeah, you just Yes, on, on Glenleith Town Council, we've got two county but are councillors. Uh, one is independent, one is applied. That's irrespective, but just to let you know who they are. Um, now, on occasions when we were discussing, say, a, a planning application, mm -hmm. and they tend not to take part in that discussion because of their judicial interest as county but are councillors. Now, I think that's a bit of holding them back a bit, really, because no, not if that's the rule. But then as community councillors, surely they should be able to take part in the full discussion on that matter. Sadly, I, I, I take your point on what you're saying, absolutely. The law doesn't necessarily allow for that in some way because you have something what's called predetermination that members have to be very careful of. So if, for example, they are on a planning committee and these two particular members, they can't really voice any opinions on applications during any particular forum. They have to consider the matter solely on what they hear at the actual planning committee itself. So because of that, that explains normally why members don't make representations at town and community council members. Because if they do, or they, they vote in favour, or they vote against, or they give some sort of commentary that can preclude them from actually taking part then in the actual planning committee where a decision is going to be made as to whether to grant planning consent because obviously the inherent conflict then as well with regards to if they want to represent views of constituents with planning officers outside of a committee meeting sometimes they've got to be careful that they're not being seen to be acting in one particular forum in a community council and then something different when they're then engaging with officers so i think the general advice and the general approach is when matters are under discussion at a county borough, sorry, a community council or town council level, and you're a county borough councillor, it's best not to facilitate or take part in those discussions. So you can keep your options open then when it comes to liaising with the, the county borough council in that sense. But it, it's it's always difficult because you want to be seen to be representing the views of your constituents and to be speaking on matters, but it is some of those legal principles that you do have to comply with, unfortunately. Right, that's good. Okay, thanks. You okay with that, Jerry? Yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Sharon, you've got a hand up and then Louise. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I may have to flick back to my papers in this. So, um, what it is, Craig, it, it talks about us engaging and assisting. The word assisting is coming up quite a lot um, in regards of standards committee with the town councils. 
Now, there seems to be a grey area here. As you said earlier, most of our complaints come from the Ombudsman, come back from the Ombudsman regarding uh, town councils and takes up an awful lot of time. But in terms of us engaging and assisting with town councils, I just feel like it, there could be an area where we are tainted should things come back to standards where we need to be completely impartial. So, you know, we could be doing exactly what you've just said about pre predetermination in um, an unwitting way. Uh, and, and I think that's not quite clear. And to go back, bringing the ombudsman back in again, I'm hoping that, that they will make more finite decisions rather than passing them back all the time to us. But this, this engagement needs to be quite clear clearly stipulated so we and we are clean we are not tainted in any way should something come back i, I agree with you wholeheartedly there council free guy I mean, I think, i'm going to flick to my uh documents now <laughs> just make I sure think, what i said everything no, I think you're absolutely right. And I think from my view, it there is no clear definition as to what is meant by engagement and assist. And for me, it's it's looking to see how we can promote, shall we say, the, the importance of standards, the importance of conduct by obligations in that sense of it. So we're not ultimately overstepping the mark, but we are making town community councillors and county borough councillors aware of what their obligations are, how they are to be applying the code of conduct, how it should be have primacy in any obviously decision that they're making, any issue which they're ultimately taking part in as a member. So I think it's important we don't cross that line, as you said, by overstepping the mark or, or doing something that maybe we would where we could come back to us then as regards to any standards here. But about spreading that message, getting that message out there in different ways. So we've looked at, for example, uh, <coughs> that I've done talks to community councils and I'm offering that a little bit more now as well, particularly as we can do it remotely in that sense as well, so we can try and get mass attendance. It, it's looking to see if members have any other ideas, obviously, as to how they may wish to suggest we, we continue to engage in that sense for us to then take forward. Right, because obviously with them giving us items as well on the forward work programme, mm -hmm. Yeah, being part of the forward work programme, I can see areas where it could be considered that they would say they wouldn't want so-and-so sitting on a, a particular committee to hear a particular complaint because mm. of predetermination. Of course, absolutely right. So it's it's something I'm always conscious of in, in the approach we do. And I, I, it will be my role, obviously, to make sure then that our members of the Standards Committee are never placed in that position. And we'll be work, I'll be working with you to make sure that you're never placed in that particular fact. As members of the Standards Committee, you were there to have that neutrality and to be able to consider matters. So it only should be a rare occasion that you would have to step out, for example, from not hearing a particular right. matter. That yeah. So again, we'd be making sure we're along the lines that your impartiality is not impacted in any sense whatsoever. Is there any, are there going to be any changes in terms of mandatory training for town council? Because that's the key. If it it's is. mandatory, then they have to undertake the training. If it's not, they don't. As I said, as it stands at the moment, legally, there's no provision that allows them to make it mandatory. Um, we can look at it potentially more from a county borough council perspective. So, for example, when we start working on the member induction programmes for the next elections, we are looking at those sort of scenarios about uh, compulsory training being attended to for code of conduct matters. Because town councils are able to set their own agendas and their own requirements, if they choose not to make it compulsory, then that's an option ultimately that they are entitled to go with at that point. We haven't got any way to insist upon that. It's, it seems like we're giving powers and we're not giving, we're not underpinning with skills and the training. That seems to be, you know, uh, very remiss, really. And, and I, I think that's something quite right. And when the Ombudsman does annual reviews and in that sense, when we do see new guidance coming out or consultations, we can bring them back here. And that can always be some representations that we can make back to the Ombudsman. And if we feel it's something that as a committee we would like to pursue down the line, we can easily look at a recommendation or a letter go into the um, the Ombudsman to suggest that, that maybe they I, may wish to consider that down the yeah, line. I can see, I think it was in agenda, either agenda three or four, it said that we do have the powers as we have used in the past to go to Welsh Government 
to go to other bodies to ensure that things that we strongly recommend mandation where it's needed. Indeed. If, if that works, then what I could look to do maybe at our next standards committee is to bring a report back on what options we could have open to us. Thank and you. I could include a draft letter and we could perhaps discuss that at the meeting on the, uh, with a way of making okay. some representations down the Thank line. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Louise, you had a question? Uh, yes. Well, actually, Sharon's asked one of the questions I was going to ask. Um, uh, just a couple of observations, really. Um, we only had five responses. How many community councils do we have, approximately? I'm going to say roughly around 14. Right. It's, um, you know, well, that's, that's about a third, isn't it? So it's... disappointing in terms of the, of the response level that you had <laughs> back, really. Um, but like you, I picked up that there were no members seeking dispensations and that struck me as really quite odd given mm. you know given how the community councils are, are really well they're all drawn from the community but given the closeness of them to the community i thought that was a little bit strange really for there to be none so was was that potentially an area to um, you know to, to to focus on um but but yes i mean it's um, it's you know given given you know, given the, the the low response, yeah, there's something that we can draw from that. But with as training isn't mandatory at the moment, um, it's a bit difficult. You know, if we're talking about engaging, how do we engage more with them, or how do you engage more with them when we only have a third of them replying to a very simple, straightforward questionnaire? So. I was just going through my mind. Could we ask the community councils how they would like? as to engage with them and get them to come back with, with, with ideas. Uh, now, you may not get a response, but at least at least you're seeking their input into it rather than us saying, you know, this is what we're going to do to you and, and see if that perhaps, um, you know, get more a bit, of, a bit more of an encouraging response that way. I, I, I think that's a perfect scenario. I, I am holding regular um, what I call town and community council clerks forums where I try to bring the clerks together to discuss things like conduct or general <laughs> legal related issues ultimately down the line. Um, so it's certainly something we can raise with them. We've, we've spoken about sort of potential training options which could be available. Um, so for example at present the training is undertaken via One Voice Wales who are the, the community council um, organisation and representatives. I've spoken about creating some bespoke training options for an NPT town and community council perspective which obviously I can present and we could make available electronically for people and given obviously the way now we are doing things via team zoom etc mm -hmm. it's an opportunity hopefully to try and speak to the masses in a sort of convenient way without having to bring them in physically for, for various mm -hmm. meetings so it's taken advantage of some of the technological innovations now that we are working to and trying to see if we can spread that message yes, in, yes. in different ways yes so you're already doing quite a lot really aren't you when, when you look at Trying, yes. and we have that engagement but I think there's always scope for more and there's yes, always different yeah. ways in which we can do things so it's it's a continuingly evolving process in my view. Yeah. yeah do you get um do, do you get a good response from the clerks when you're holding something specifically for them because quite clearly they are key people <laughs> in the community councils aren't they? Um, I would say I roughly get about six or seven in oh, attendance okay. on these sort of uh, meetings. Um, it, it tends to be the, the same six or seven, ultimately. Okay. I will hear from clerks every now and then, and I've probably had a lot of contact with them during the pandemic where they've had some queries, for example, on what facilities can be open, what do they do yeah. in, in this sort of scenario. Um, so there are a core group who are very vocal and very active, and they, they, we do engage a lot with them. And there are some, it would just be more sporadic emails and, yeah. and correspondence but the, the offer is open to all of them to yeah. attend and we we managed to create a central venue in one of our sort of um business centers which we can bring people in and we it's about two or three hours it used to be in the afternoons just to try and go through things we've held one virtually and i think i've got another one now scheduled for early march time mm. okay thanks craig thank you thank you very much okay does does anybody else have any questions for craig at this well, I, I did chair, just put in the chat box. I just wondered if clerk training, that's bound to be mandatory, is it? Again, no, because the, the clerks obviously oh, are separate. Um, 
employees or that, that they have no affiliation ultimately with the council. Um, there's no specific qualification that any clerk ultimately can hold. And you see clerks from a variety of backgrounds. I always make sure that the training, for example, that I give community councillors and county borough councillors, I will also give to the clerks, but I do it from a different perspective as opposed to telling members, you have to do this. I explain to clerks how they need to make sure that their members are doing certain factors. So I call it a train the trainer type of event almost just about. So these clerks know what the basic obligations are and how they then should be enforcing them with their members. And I offer then a, a sort of general advice then if they have any particular queries for them to contact me on on any related issues. But to be fair, Craig, if uh, if they don't know really the protocol or the process of how the meeting should be conducted, <coughs> I can I can see how we've had so many things come coming back and coming to us in terms of complaints. So the correlation between the underpinning here of training is important because it could result in far fewer complaints. Indeed. Could I not just yeah, Jerry? Yeah, we've just up in Glenith, we've just been going through uh, had a little bit of uh, turbulence shall we say looking for our clerks uh, up until a few years ago we'd had the one clerk Clive for a good number of years then he left uh, we had a very short-term clerk who had no experience of being a clerk and he found that a bit difficult although he was very good for the very short time that he was there and then we had to advertise and we had a lady uh, Alison from Port Call who was now working for the council excellent she really pulled us up by the our bootstraps you know and unfortunately she left for a full-time job with Nick but Albert and we had a deputy we've got a deputy clerk now who has been an experienced clerk in a small uh, community council in England and she's doing an excellent job uh, when we advertised most recently we did put lay down an expectation that they would undertake the is it the silk qualification yeah. for local for community councils um, we advertised with that organization but we didn't have one one response. Uh, we did advertise to One Voice Wales. We didn't have one response. I think we've just gone open again now, and we've got about ten applications, ten applicants in. But what the what training they've had, or what the backgrounds are, we've just got to suck it and see. And if there's no, if, if, if the, the nature of the um, and the size of the community councils, I think that makes or the parish councils or town councils, whatever you call them, that makes one heck of a difference. I'm also on a council in Powys for a Strabelted Community Council. Totally different kettle of fish to Glenith Town Council. Absolutely totally different. What our responsibilities are, how the clerk works. She's also the clerk for about two or three other parish councils, I believe. And uh, it's, it, it's such a wide variation of expectations on the councils that um, one, one, how can I say, one qualification or one criteria doesn't fit all councils because of the, the, the nature and size. Just one of those difficult things. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jerry. Louise. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Chair. I was just going through my mind that uh, I wonder if there's any mileage in encouraging community councils to look to uh, Neath Patoba Council for Voluntary Services in terms of the courses that they put on. And I'm just thinking of generic skills. So, for example, chairing skills. I'm pretty sure CVS would do those kind of courses because, of course, you know that they, they will be putting them on for the voluntary sector and community councils are volunteers as well. But they perhaps might be receptive um, if uh, you know to going to the CVS to do those kind of courses, which would uh, increase their skills without uh, relying on the council or without the council. Uh, sort of saying, uh, you know, these are the courses I, you know, appreciate not from the more uh, particular aspects like conduct, but certainly for those generic skills, uh, I just wonder, could, could you perhaps, as I say, encourage them to look to CVS to see, or actually ask CVS what they could offer the community councils, and right. could they do something particularly for them? And you, you know, we may find that might elicit a better response. Just a thought. I 
that, that, no, that, that's a very good, it, it's not something I give in consideration to. I will make contact with our representative we, we have in, in CBS. I do speak to them quite often yeah. and I ask that question. Thank you. No, that's a very helpful tip. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Louise. Can I Thank just... you, Sharon? Yeah, can I just come back on that? I, I think I totally agree with Louise on, the, on that. But I would say that our time as a committee largely spends a lot of time on the complaints. So in terms of the code of conduct and the way um, the things that people can and cannot do should be made mandatory for clerks. And it's our responsibility to ensure that some organisation somewhere makes that mandatory for them. So they're guiding, they're able to guide consistently and coherently amongst all town councils in the same way, you know, going through meetings. And then we would have far fewer complaints coming back to us from the Ombudsman. What I would propose then, Council Freegard, if, if the committee would be happy with this, is if I mentioned we would bring a report on the next occasion to look at some representations to Welsh Government or Ombudsman, I'll make some contact with One Voice Wales and our sort of liaisons there, and I'll ask them what criteria, obviously, what qualifications they insist, obviously, for clerks with certain skills that are needed, what is available to it, to try and get the understanding of the various options out there and um, to see then obviously what mandatory training they insist or they provide ultimately to community councils in that regard. So I, I'll try and get a bigger picture as to what those issues are so we can have perhaps a more sort of um, conclusive and more accurate debate then on those options which are there and we can make a discussion then how we can feed that back in, in representations to Welsh Government, the Ombudsman and other bodies potentially. Okay, thank you Chair, thank you Craig. Thank you Sharon, thank you Craig. Um, anybody else? Well, I think this item of the agenda has generated more, uh, shall I say, excitement than any of the other agenda items. So there genuinely is an interest in uh, town and community councils and their conduct. Uh, we perhaps can consider town and community councils, we all have our perceptions perhaps of, um, of, of the way that business is conducted in these councils. Uh, Tolerance doesn't mean acceptance. If there are a number of complaints generated by town and community councils, then we as a standards committee have a duty to uh, to do what we can do to reduce that. Um, I agree with Councillor Frigard that as emotional and as exciting things can get in a town or community council, then there are rules. Um, and somebody has got to know what the rules are, and somebody has to make sure that the rules are abided to. Now, whether that's the clerk or whether it's the chairman, um, could be both. Um, I've heard the stories, and many of us have heard the stories of the way the chairman are elected. It's almost it's my turn, so and perhaps not having the gifts of chairing is just simply it's my turn, so I'll have the status. Trust that uh, we ought to recognise. Um, and the other thing is, of course, the, the political differences, perhaps, which are a little more highlighted at that level. I can think of the Air Community Council, not too far from me, at one time was quite honest, quite disgraceful, and they conduct all over political differences. Um, now, they're there to represent their uh, constituents and that locality, which they represent, not without political battles. Umpteen things I can think of that we as a standards committee can be more proactive about and get involved with town and community councils and do in our way through Craig um, what we can do to advise them that you can get as excited and as emotional as you like but there are rules. It's like a game of rugby, you can get very emotional and excited about things like that but Nigel soon puts you right and we need a Nigel perhaps on, the, on town and community council. Anyway, that's my little bit. There's Dennis, you've got your hand there. You have a question, Dennis? Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, as a county councillor, and we county councillors <coughs> are governed by a very strict set of rules. Um, our members' members' code of conduct is one which guides us on what we can do and what we can't do. But what I, what I concern is that these community councils inevitably will come under the umbrella of Neath Portobello County Borough Council. 
So what they do reflects on us as a council as a whole, because the public out there don't understand. They really don't understand, you know, the difference. And the thing is, is that, OK, we are here to make rules. Or we are we here to guide people? So why can't we as a council say to our community councils, look, this is the way it has to be done and this is the way it will be adhered to, as we councillors, county councillors have to do, because we are governed by law. You know, just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Can I come in quickly again there? Uh, probably since I've been back on the council this time around, we did have, uh, we have had one or two quite stern notes from the chief executive of the Port Talbot County Borough Council because of the way things were going up in Glynny. I make no bones about that. We, that that has happened. I don't know how the chief exec got to know about those things going on in the council, but he certainly did respond to them. And he said, you know, you better pull your finger out and wise up a bit, to put it bluntly. And, uh, and thankfully, that's what has happened for, for many different reasons. Uh, I think the politi politicalization certainly on our council has gone out of the window a little bit, which is a very, you know, a, a very good thing. Um, and it's, it's it's more for the individuals. It, I think if we're in a healthier situation than we are now, but we've had to go through some pretty rough times to get to where we are now, you know? Yeah, I'm sure, uh, Jerry, that, that, that that's what does happen. That, uh, as I say, you can get as excited and emotional and raise voices you like, but there are rules that you don't. And because once you start not abiding by those rules, then you are not doing what you were um, are there to do to represent your constituents. You're getting more interested in members of that particular council. I'm not doing a very good job of this, but I think that the number one priority is you are there to serve those that elected you. And you do that in a manner um, which generates respect from those that elected you. You don't want to be appearing to, uh, to your electorate or to others as being not competent to do that. I, I got that off my chest, I'm feeling better now. Dennis, <laughs> you, your hand is still up. Do you still have a question or have you forgotten to take right? Thank you, Dennis. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everybody else. And uh, there aren't any. Um, let me just have a quick look. Are there any urgent items, Tommy? <coughs> no. no. No, Chair. Well, if there aren't any um, urgent items, uh, can I say thanks to everybody who's attended, those I've seen and those I haven't seen. Tom, we did hear you, Tom. So Thanks very much. Um, but to everybody, thanks very much for attending and uh, we'll see you again at the next meeting. Now, I don't know whether that will be virtual or whether we'll actually be able to reach out and touch, uh, but whatever. Thank you very much for your attendance and see you at the next meeting. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye all. Thanks. Bye.